So what are five lesser known multi-cloud mistakes that everyone is making? Let's talk about it. So welcome back to the Cloud Computing Insider YouTube channel and podcast where we talk about the realities of cloud computing and how to make this stuff work for your enterprise. I'm your host, David Linthicum, author, speaker, b Geek, and here to tell you about the realities of cloud computing and how to see beyond some of the hype that's out there right now. So first, an important bit of business. <laughs> so how, do we, how are we supposed to spell multi-cloud? Some people spell it uh, multi-cloud, and some people spell it multi-cloud one word. I've been doing, taking the one word uh, approach, uh, but I see it in all kinds of different ways. Uh, however, the correct term, as I did my research, is multi-cloud one word. So, and according to uh, the internet, at least the majority of articles that I read, this is the accepted spelling in the industry when referring to the strategy or practice of using multiple cloud computing services from different vendors in a coordinated manner. So there you go. So that's why I use the term multi-cloud one word and did it in my book and do it in my articles and uh, people push back on that, but turns out I was right. So keep that in mind. So the idea here was to talk about uh, mistakes that people are making that are lesser known. Obviously, you know, performance issues and cost issues. Uh, th those are pretty well understood as very, very common mistakes that people are making uh, with multi-cloud deployments. But there are a set of mistakes that I see being made that typically aren't as well understood and aren't as well known. So we're going to talk about those. So the first lesser known mistake is failure to plan for data portability. Organizations may overlook the complexities involved in moving data between different cloud providers. Uh, data portability uh, deals with complexity, uh, and many times the data is going to be locked into a particular vendor or cloud provider. And the idea that if we can put information in Microsoft and put information in Google and put information in AWS, and then it's going to be easy to integrate those data sources between the different cloud providers is a fantasy. <laughs> so it's a, it's going to be very difficult, in some cases very expensive, because, because you're going to pay, uh, not all the time, but egress and ingress fees in into the particular cloud providers. And also you have to have data portability with your uh, on-premise on systems as well. So you need to have a solid data management plan that occurs strategies for data migration, synchronization, and backup across the providers. And I can't recommend that enough. And one of the things that I do when I work on a multi-cloud deployment or multi-cloud architecture is do a plan around where the data is going to be stored, how it's going to be maintained, how we're going to deal with security, how we're going to deal with data governance, how we're going to deal with uh, business continuity, disaster recovery things, and also taking a realistic look at what data needs to move where, either in terms of real-time processing, in other words, applications need access to data that resides in another cloud provider, and they need to have that, have that in near real time because of their application processing systems, inventory control, things like that. And you really kind of have to go through those scenarios a ton when doing a multi-cloud deployment. And if I see people pushing back on their multi-cloud deployment, it's almost always around data portability issues. In other words, they didn't realize it would be so expensive, so complex, uh, didn't understand they would have to use layers of middleware uh, to move this data in between these various systems. Real-time integration, sometimes integration, the ability to use ETL to extract, translate load systems, the ability to populate uh, business, business intelligence systems from multiple data sources. It's probably one of the more complex things that people deal with, and it's normally not considered as much as it should. And so these are problems that people will find as they start moving into the deployment phase that they didn't plan for in the design phase, in the architecture phase. And it really should be a, a number one priority when you do that. Trust me. So the next mistake that uh, people uh, often don't consider is underestimating network latency and bandwidth costs. Moving data and services between different cloud environments can introduce a lot of network latency and significant bandwidth costs. Again, we're getting to the integration of the different cloud brands, Microsoft, Google, um, AWS. And these factors can get into application performance and lead to unexpected expenses. So in other words, um, they can be low performing because of the latency uh, price that we're paying as we're moving things from cloud to cloud or even from on-prem to cloud and from cloud on-prem. 
but also there's a cost in doing that. Again, the egress fees and ingress fees that cloud providers charge you. Uh, so you may find that you're not expecting a uh, $10,000, you're expecting a uh, $1,000 bill at the end of the month, you end up getting a $10,000 bill, or in some cases, a $100,000 bill, because you didn't anticipate the network costs of integrating the different cloud providers and, and allowing them to share and exchange information across the two. So you should consider network latency and bandwidth costs. And I think this goes hand in hand with the uh, data portability stuff that we just talked about in the last mistake that people are making. So they should be considered uh, as being tightly coupled. You should understand both of these issues at the same time. And again, uh, you don't plan for this. You're going to end up with an expense that you didn't anticipate. And I'm seeing that come up now when a lot of people are getting into multi-cloud deployments, uh, which is a good thing, but they're just not doing the planning they need uh, to ensure that they're using this stuff in an effective and efficient way. So in the next mistake that most people don't consider would be lack of a unified management dashboard. So you have to have centralized management to deal with multiple clouds. The idea that we're going to deal with each cloud provider using whatever native capabilities for operational stuff and security stuff that that particular cloud provider is providing means you're going to be dealing with an environment that's going to be overly complex because you're dealing with automation silos that exist with each cloud provider brand. Instead, there needs to be a unified management approach where we're dealing with abstraction and so we're leveraging one dashboard, one console for security management, for operations management, for data management, for all of these things that are going to be specific services that are needed by each of the cloud providers that, that, are, that are part of the multi-cloud. But if we try to deploy them and solve the problem within the domain of each of those clouds, it's going to end up with something that's going to be overly complex. Too many systems. You're going to have to have people around with those particular skills and talent to maintain those particular cloud silos. That is not a good idea. So a unified dashboard, unified management and operations layer will streamline operations, providing visibility and control over your, ulti your entire multi-cloud environment. And again, we're solving the problem once. Now, it's a harder problem to solve because we're dealing with operations and security and governance across different cloud brands, as many as five or six sometimes in some of these more complex multi-cloud deployments. But you don't want to solve the problem for every cloud provider that you're using. You want to solve that problem one time. It's a harder problem to solve, uh, but dealing with abstraction, commonality, and the ability to find common operations and management layers is, is key to allowing these multi-cloud deployments to work longer term. So next would be ignoring differences in security protocols. So different uh, cloud providers may adhere to various security protocols and standards. Uh, people don't anticipate this and annoying, ignoring the differences can lead to security gaps that end up with uh, uh, you not having the security that you need, which is causing vulnerabilities, raising the risk of uh, uh, breaches and things like that. So ensuring that security policies are consistent and compatible across the cloud platform is critical to maintaining the robust security platform. If you notice some commonalities in what these problems are referring to, or what these mistakes are referring to, is a lack of doing things uh, using a single unified layer. And the ability to deal with security uh, with each of the cloud brands, with whatever security, native security system they're providing, and that's your security solution, is just gonna end up with something that's overly complex and therefore it's gonna be uh, overly risky. In other words, the more complex it is, the more difficult it is to manage uh, in any unified way, and the more you're gonna have a risk of a breach occurring uh, just because you're, you're keeping track of too many moving parts. So to deal with commonality of security systems, you need to look for common security protocols that run across different cloud providers, uh, common security management systems, common identity access management systems, for example, that integrate all the various public cloud providers, your private cloud, and other things that you may have on-prem. So keep that in mind. And uh, good security engineers should know how to do this. And it's I'm not finding a lot of them out there that can answer the question, at least in interviews, uh, as to how you would approach multi-cloud security. And most people will respond to, well, I'm going to use whatever native systems are provided by the particular cloud brand. That won't scale. It's going to lead to a risky security profile. You don't want that. So that's a huge mistake that people are making. And we're going to see some breaches that occur over the next several years in multi-cloud deployments where they 
ignored the complexity. They ignored commonalities of security protocols, and the hackers were able to exploit that. And you don't want to be part of that party. So next would be overcomplicating automation processes. Automation is vital to manage multi-cloud environments. And your ability to automate workflows to uh, make things not a manual process uh, each and every step of the time, your ability to back things up, your ability to deal with security maintenance, your ability to deal with data maintenance, all these things through automation is going to provide you with a much more manageable environment that's going to be much more cost effective because you're not having to rely on human beings to carry out all these particular very fine-grained tasks. So you need to simplify and standardize the automation processes to ensure that they're both reliable, easy to troubleshoot, and update. And so many times when people approach a multi-cloud deployment, they take automation to just an overly complex level, and they don't put a lot of planning design with how these things are automated, how things are backed up, and how applications are maintained, things like that. Automation is a fundamental tool that will allow you to deploy and leverage a very healthy multi-cloud architecture, multi-cloud deployment. But if you overuse it and you don't think through how this automation is going to work and don't do the design and planning you need to do that, uh, then you're going to find yourself in trouble pretty quickly. And I'm seeing people are spending too much money on this. They end up with automation techniques that actually remove efficiency out of the system. So automation is supposed to make things more efficient and make things more reliable. And that they overcomplicate it. They use the wrong tools. They use a heterogeneous automation solution. It means different technologies uh, that are in there for different reasons. And end up making it overly complex, again, another theme, and therefore re removing a lot of the value of the automation. You don't want to be in that boat. Well, that's all I have for you this week. Don't forget to like, subscribe. Also, uh, comment below. Let me know what you want to hear on this, uh, on this channel. Uh, also, check out my blog on InfoWorld. Uh, check out my LinkedIn learning courses. Got several that are coming up the next few months. Excited about those. Lots of new AI content uh, that's going to be out there. And also, um, join us over on the GoCloud Careers, uh, a, a generative AI architecture course, fully mentored, long-form course. I, I'm, I'm on these uh, calls four hours a week answering questions. We're sharing information. We're trying to become the best generative AI architects that we can be and working with a lot of people to gain those skills. And if you're looking out there, obviously, we need those skills now. So until next time, you guys be safe. Take care. Cheers. Bye.